Thank you. Thank you for having me. It is such an honor and a privilege to be here. This lineup is amazing and I kind of can't believe I'm a part of it. Um, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the work of the writers in this room and I'm just very grateful to be here. So I hope you can all hear me okay. Um, I'm going to pretend that I'm looking into a room of people and not at my own face. And actually, I'm probably just gonna toggle out of this screen so that I don't have to look at my own face the whole time, cause that's weird. Um, but um, so I'm gonna tell you a story about Nerves of Steel and about my book, Tomboy Land, which is here. It's about a little over two months old. Um, and it's also a story about my grandmother. Um, so here goes. Um, okay, so anyone who knows me, um, and certainly anyone who has read my book, um, knows that I have a history of risk taking um, in both writing and in life. I've been called things like fearless. Uh, I've been called a lot of other things too, um, including but not limited to brave, bold, intrepid, impulsive, edgy, uh, and sometimes maybe a little stupid. Um, and I think I've always been this way. Uh, so when I was about seven or eight, um, this was in the late eighties or early nineties, my grandmother got me a t-shirt. Now my fellow Gen X millennial cuspers out there, um, remember no fear. So this is the point where I'm pretending that I'm looking out into an audience and seeing all your heads nodding vigorously. Some of you might be slapping your um, thighs and laughing. I'm here for all your late 80s, early 90s nostalgia needs. Um, so no fear. Um, I was doing a little research when I was prepping for this talk and I found out that no fear, um, this brand was founded in 1989 by a pair of race car driving brothers, um, one of whom drove uh, for NASCAR, which was very popular where I grew up in um, rural working class Wisconsin. Um, and in high school, actually, I spent a little time at the Madison International Speedway where a friend of mine drove a pace car, but that is a digression. Um, but anyway, no fear like NASCAR was incredibly popular in my small town. Um, and in my research, I found out that it was branded as something like um, a, an extreme sports clothing brand with attitude for men. Um, so very specific. Um, and the themes they'll tell you on their About Us page um, dealt with uh, lack of fear of death, lack of laziness, and contempt for social norms. I also discovered in this research that they have since filed for chapter 11 bankruptcy. So anyway, my grandmother got me this no fear shirt for Christmas one year, or maybe a birthday. I wanted one very badly because all the boys had them and I wanted all the things the boys had. Um, so she got me this shirt and it was all black, um, which is typically my uniform now these days still. Um, but this one had the no fear logo on the chest. And so for those of you who are not familiar with No Fear, it was like a badly designed metal band logo. Um, and all of these shirts had different sayings on them. And on the back of mine, it said, if you're not living on the edge, you're taking up too much space. So I was obsessed with this shirt. I was I was so obsessed with this shirt, I wore this shirt out. I wore it so often that I'm pretty sure my mom had to like peel it from my body, sweaty and damp in order to put it in the wash. And I'd like to think if I could rewrite this memory that I stood shirtless in the laundry room like with my little fists on my hips and said, God, mom, laundry is like such a social norm. Uh, but. The truth is that I didn't really know what social norms were then when I was that young. Um, but in a way, I think I was already starting to break them. Um, so my, my grandmother passed away um, a few years ago. Um, she was the last of my grandparents to go and the only one that I was ever really close with um, or at least as close as uh, Midwesterners allow ourselves to be. Um, and she always encouraged me to take the bold leap, to follow my dreams. Um, she never told me I needed to settle down, to get married, to have kids, to do the things that she did. 
and that for the most part, um, most people where I come from did and still do. Um, my grandmother came from a multi-generational farm family, Irish Catholic. She was like in the 4-H club in the FFA. She was one of nine children. She had eight of her own. Um, and, and she lived the life that for the most part, um, I think was sort of laid out before her husband, kids, job, um, you know, and the hope that you uh, work to the point where you have a comfortable retirement. And she made a pretty good life for herself. She worked in a cheese factory um, for most of it and um, saved up enough that she could do some traveling. Um, but my grandfather, who was a GM lifer, uh, lost his pension in, in the General Motors collapse. And um, they lost just about everything. And that was the first time in my life, I think, you know, I was still pretty young at the time that I realized that I began to understand that even if you follow the path, even if you do the things that you're supposed to do that are expected of you, there's still no guarantee that you'll get uh, to where you want to be. Um, but my grandmother, much like my parents, um, I think, saw in me um, from a young age that I was a little bit different, um, that I might do something different. And that t-shirt, I would like to think, uh, was her way of encouraging that spirit um, of pushing me to jump. After I left Wisconsin, um, I, was, I was 26, I left Wisconsin to move to New York um, to be a writer. Uh, we wrote to each other a lot, we wrote letters, um, and, and she always remarked on how brave she thought I was, uh, how brave it was for me to leave my home, to follow my dreams of being a writer, to get up on stages in New York City and play music in my bands. Um, she always wrote that kind of stuff. And I would always apologize for not writing enough. And she would always write back and say something like, it's okay, you're busy living. Which of course made me terribly guilty, um, made me feel very guilty, but uh, I think she meant it, you know? Um, so when I was planning this talk, I, you know, knowing this history of my risk taking, I had no idea which story I was going to tell. Um, there are so many that I could choose from, many of which made their way into my book. Um, stories about playing my own extreme sports. I played ice hockey when I was a kid. I played roller derby when I was older. Sports in which you um, willingly hit other humans and get hit um, and get concussed um, on various forms of skates. Uh, I could have told you about the time I spent in the BDSM scene, about a particular time when I was tied up to a St. Andrew's cross uh, in a nightclub and whipped in front of a bunch of strangers by an elder uh, dom named Sir Keith. Could have told you that. Um, I could have told you about the time that I sailed across the North Sea alone. Um, I could have told you about, um, basically I could have spent this whole time talking about this decision to leave Wisconsin, to move to New York alone, um, to be a writer. Um, or how almost a decade later, um, after finding a good job, um, a stable job with a decent salary and a retirement um, account, I quit that job and left again to live in the woods of Wisconsin alone in a cabin by myself for six weeks um, to finish my book. Unarmed, mind you, um, in a place where most people are armed, um, just a woman alone in the wilderness in a place of bears and uh, more serial killers than like the Wisconsin tourist boards would want you to know about. So anyway, um, could have told you all of that. But then I realized that the people here in this room watching this reading, the other writers in this room, um, the Zoom room, whatever room we're in, um, probably aren't the kind of people for whom such stories feel very bold or very brave. There are probably many of you who have made similar decisions, tried similar things, taken bold leaps, probably bolder than ones I have taken, um, just done things that require nerves of steel. Um, but the truth is that where I come from and the people I come from, the place I come from, these things that I've done and these stories that um, I have told in my book um, 
are still pretty freaky. Uh, <laughs> some people might think they're a little crazy. Um, so then it hit me that if I'm going to tell a story about nerves of steel, the thing that I have done in my life that required the steeliest of nerves uh, was to put this book in the world. Um, I've been writing it for a really long time, toiling alone on it, you know, um, and it's it's a collection of essays that, you know, are deeply personal. Um, and so, you know, talking about things that, like, we don't talk about in the Midwest, and I'm talking about, like, essays dealing with my sexuality and my gender identity and, like, this time in college when I was sexually assaulted and uh, drinking and uh, depression and self-harm and a suicide attempt and the way that Midwesterners deal or don't um, with their problems and their pain. Um, these are things that in many cases I never told anyone, like including uh, some of the people closest to me. So in many ways, publishing this book was a coming out. Um, and there are stories in it and secrets in it that I was so afraid to tell and that the truth is that I'm still afraid to tell. Then once again, curiously, people have used the word um, fearless to describe this book. Um, and this word, kind of like the word brave, I think has a complicated relationship for writers, um, maybe especially women who write nonfiction like me. Um, but the truth is that it's not fearless at all. It's terrifying. Um, there really isn't actually a day that goes by when I don't feel a little bit afraid um, because these are stories that once belonged only to me. And now they belong to everybody, anybody who reads them. Uh, who bring their own experiences and their own biases and their own political beliefs and their own values to those stories, um, many of which consider parts of my life to be not just deviant, but that threaten their understanding of, of how life should be. And since putting this book out into the world, um, I, I have gotten a few responses, even by people um, I think of as family that have existed in this space. Um, and that's been really hard. But um, for the most part, this very cool thing is happening too, where um, you know I've been getting messages from total strangers uh, across the country and abroad and old friends that I haven't talked to for like 30 years. Um, and, and some family members who I didn't even think would read this thing, let alone, let alone connect to it in any way, um, who have written me to tell me how much the book meant to them, how seen they felt by it, how much it resonated. Um, and a lot of these people have told me uh, how brave it was for me to write it. Some people even said, um, one person in particular said, uh, it made me feel brave too. So I guess the whole point of this is that uh, Having nerves of steel, it turns out, I'm, I'm beginning to understand, doesn't mean having no fear. Uh, it doesn't mean fearlessness at all. I, I think it means uh, making decisions and taking leaps um, and going down um, somewhat uncharted paths in the face of fear. Um, my grandmother didn't live long enough to see this book get published. She was a voracious reader um, and she was very proud of my writing and she had like every literary magazine I have ever published in and she forced me to take pictures with her holding the magazine. Um, but I had never written anything so personal as what I, what I wrote in this book and I wonder sometimes um, what she'd think of it. If she'd be shocked or, or scandalized or horrified. Um, but I think, um, she wouldn't be. I think she would probably like take a long pull of her brandy and water and laugh. She had this great big laugh. She had a smoker's cough and a laugh. And um, she would she would just be proud and she would be happy to see that all of those bold leaps I have taken and um, all of the times I had to have those nerves of steel and all of the time I spent living on the edge 
uh, had paid off. And um, she might not be able to read this book, um, but her life and her impact on me um, is all over it. And it was dedicated to her. <laughs>